I'm the minor match before the All Ireland tomorrow. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, I, I won't keep you too late. So, you now it's funny. I'm kind of I'm what I'm saying fits after uh, what um, we'll talk about tomorrow. And he's talking about Pratt, who was the, the first person to be involved in the town. So I, my talk is about James Moore and his involvement in Newport between roughly 1740 and 1765. He was the land agent here. So basically what happened was, when John, he had a dilemma. What am I going to do? The lease had reverted to him. He had a town in the process of development a community of Quaker tenants who weren't very happy and they were preparing to leave the area. And he had a 70,000 acre estate stretching from Kilmina right around here and out as far as Acco, that's of Acco, and up as far as Valley Croy. Um, so where would he turn? Sale of the property wasn't feasible at the time and perhaps if life had worked out otherwise Captain Pratt might not only have founded the town of Newport or could have developed it to its uh, full potential as a resident landlord, or could have developed it to its uh, full potential as a resident landlord, but that didn't happen. Well, it wasn't to be. He died actually in 1741, but I'll leave that to John Moore tomorrow to tell you more about that. So the town to which he had a short connection continued, funnily enough, to bear his name intermittently for more than a hundred years. Funnily enough, to bear his name intermittently for more than a hundred years. And when I came here and went <laughs> down to Rice College to teach history, um, I was talking and I stood up in front of the class and said, I live up in Newport Pratt. <laughs> wow, you should never say that to a bunch of years. <laughs> I meant Pratt wasn't their favourite word, but so what the hell. Anyway, um, just going back a little bit, the Quakers were well known and, and sought out as potential farm tenants, and especially in the whole area of flax growing, linen weaving and the ancillary, ancillary industries that came from that. But their new their was only for around 20 years and they had left many of them for, for a place called Bally Murray in Roscommon before eventually going to Moat. Uh, so that all happened before Pratt died and the man that was to follow Pratt was probably a man called James Hennon who uh, was probably a man called James Hennon who uh, there is some slight evidence of his tenure as a kind of a, a land agent on the estate. It appears in the rent roll of 1729 that's signed by him. Um, there were Quakers also resident in or near the town by the name of Hennon in 1925. And Kenneth Carroll mentions the surname Hennon and variants as existing among the Quaker community in Newport. So it's possible he was the land agent, if you like, that preceded uh, James Moore. And he was probably, possibly, a member of that community. And he may have resigned his position as land agent during... Yeah, i just pull up this picture because I'll show you a picture. Um, it's Newport, and it's about 1823, so it's a bit after our time of, the, um, of the, the Quakers. But you can see that the bridge is there. You can see probably Nathan and places like that in the background. And with this... Uh, you can see the church, one of the churches up there, and so on. You can see Castle Bar uh, Street over here, or, Castle, uh, what, or as it may have been, uh, it may have been Taylor Road. And that's possibly, possibly, and I guess that might have been the possibly, and I guess that might have been the uh, port collector's uh, office or uh, home, or whatever you like to call it. Um, so James Moore then was the land agent who resided in Newport and developed the town. That's basically it. Uh, over the next 20 years or so, taking over from the practice, uh, particularly where the landlord resided elsewhere, uh, for a land agent to be appointed by the landlord to carry out the day-to-day -day, uh, management of the estate. You know, the fixing of rents, for example, the collection of rents, making sure that tenants carried out the conditions of their leases, planting trees, planting trees, looking after certain crops, growing crops, making improvements and so on and so forth. So they're the kind of things that the land agent was responsible for doing. Well, the further uh, responsibility of Moore's was that of collector of port revenues. And it's interesting, 
collector of port revenues. And it's interesting that Newport was probably the primary port of entry to Mayo. And that was a situation that continued throughout much of the 18th century, until possibly the Browns of Westport claimed that privilege for Westport, because they began, Westport claimed that privilege for Westport, because they began to develop the town at a much faster and more successful rate than Newport had been developing. And so Westport became, if you like, the uh, primary port. Right? Although neither of them, as we would probably say, wouldn't be suitable for really heavy going, uh, would come into Newport. But that would be about it, maybe up to four or five hundred tons max, and depending on the tides for unloading. You know, So they were factors that we have to take into account. So, um, you know, James Moore was attracted to the estates, and in the mid 18th century, he dominated not the village. Um, in, in, a, in a desecrated vault in, in Nakabili Glebe. All those years ago when I went looking for it, I found it and I found the in, inscription, which I'll show you at the end, that's on his grave, and I reckon that it was robbed for the lead that's in it. Um, and really, there were, there were no bones or anything else that I could describe. I brought it to the attention of different authorities, and myself and Cyril Moore, and I don't know if he was involved in that, but others, we, we talked about what could be done, but the advice we got from the authorities was, but the advice we got from the authorities was, leave it alone, it's a wildlife sanctuary almost. The church in Nakabili Glebe is falling apart as well, it's probably in a dangerous state, um, but it once rang with the voice of Dr. Pocock, and I'll mention him in a few moments, so we decided to probably mention that. The O'Donnell Estate uh, uh, vault is also up there, but it's very well sealed and it's still intact. So, anyway, Moore uh, started and his job was to help uh, develop, um, develop the uh, estate. And among the things that he did, estate, and among the things that he did, and I don't know, if, uh, yeah, I just put that up for you about a little bit about of the estate of where, where the Medicots got it, they got the estate, if you like, uh, from uh, the, uh, if you like, the uh, Dukes of Ormond, because they needed money to sustain, sustain their lavish lifestyle. Many of us will know, will, when we think of Ormond, say, well, who is he talking about? I'm talking about King Kenny Castle, for example, and those people who <coughs> lived there and their lifestyle, and they needed the money, so they leased the estate to Thomas Medicot, who worked in Dublin Castle, was involved in finance as well. So, Medicaid, when our friend James Moore died, the lease reverted back to the, to the Medicaid, and of course eventually then, as Peter will explain more tomorrow, <coughs> the Medicaid, the, the, the O'Donnells were ready to step in and buy the lease of the estate at that stage. So you can see that the estate went from the lease of the estate at that stage. So you can see that the estate went from the Ormonds it went through to Pratt for a short time, and then it, it went to, not to James Moore, he was just the agent, it went back to the Medicots, and from the Medicots it went on to the O'Donnells. So that's the kind of the history of the, the Borishul, if you like, the Borishul. Moore's job was, uh, if you like, or part of Moore's job was to um, help develop the town. And among the things that he, he, he did was he developed the, the, the key. But one of the interesting little things that came out, somebody asked me about land agents. Now look, there are from Robin Flower in his book, The Western Isle. The landlords were sometimes decent men, they will tell you, says Robin Flower in The Western Isle, but the agents were divils, one and all. I don't believe that in the case of James <coughs> Moore. Everything, um, it, my analysis of his account, because I'm, I, everything is based on was forensic. I spent months reading and looking at every letter that he wrote, because they're handwritten by himself, to try and figure out. And I came to the conclusion, he had, this was a decent guy. This was a nice guy. He was a nice guy. He looked after the poor. He looked after all kinds of people, and you'll see in a comment later on. He even looked after the poor. He looked after all kinds of people, and you'll see in a comment later on. He even looked after the sailors who came in and bought them drink. That was because they unloaded the ship for him, of course. But, um, you know, he wasn't a bad sort. And uh, so I'm not entirely in agreement with Robin Flower, but it's an interesting observation about land agents. 
So anyway, let's go back to an interesting observation about land agents. So anyway, let's go back to Moore and what he's doing in the town. First thing he's doing, or one of the first things he's doing is, he's supervising the building of the quay that we all know and walk down along. That comes from James Moore's time in the middle of the 18th century. That's James Moore's doing, Moore's doing the building of the quay, right? So every time he passed off from the quay down there and go out the bay, they're gone from James Moore's quay. Another thing he did was he supervised the building of the new Protestant church up in Nottabilly Gilead, the one that is now in ruins, right? And also he had a lot to do with the building of the Rhine, which would be, have been in the vicinity of where Kelly's Kitchen is today. That was the first Roman Catholic church in the town itself. That's, that's an interesting one, because we also know that he looked after money for various church members, both Catholic and Protestant. For the, uh, for the for the priest of uh, priest called Mount for the uh, for the for the priest of uh, priest called Mount Brown, he looked after his money uh, for him. So that's worth knowing about uh, about James Moore, right? So the town he was also involved um, in the bit, sorry in the development of Market Street, which is now Main, Main Street area just out in front of the hotel here. Um, the town appears to have thrived during his time. And the records that he has show ships of German and French origins coming into the port, right? And so James Moore made his fortune, and he did make a fortune, in a variety of enterprises from importing wine, involved in money exchange, he was involved in, to a degree, if you like, in, a, in, a, in banking. He was involved in an awful lot of things. His life, his, 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 his family lived the life of the gentry. He had five daughters, that's interesting, he had no sons, he had five <coughs> daughters. And they were educated in Dublin, Dublin, and his own activity, believe it or not, was horse racing at Brafey. That's where he used to go to have his fun. He went to Brafey and he probably backed on the horses, maybe even owned horses. During his time there then, there were other visitors coming to the town. Notable visitors, such as, there were other visitors coming to the town. Notable visitors such as uh, Dr. Pocock that I mentioned earlier, he actually preached up in Napavilly Glebe uh, Church and he visited the ruined Dominican Friary out of Horishul, where the original settlement was. You know, that was the, the old port in our documentary film about Newport. The old port was out there at uh, the, the, just across, the town was just across from where the abbey was. Right? And that was, of course, where the butlers of Almond built their castle. It was once, just as a matter of interest, a tower house on top of the hill over, up, over opposite the church. If you look across the stretch of water, the top of the hill, there are some of the ruins, some of the stonework still there. Archaeologists, please take note, you would love it. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, work that could be done up there, I imagine, at some stage in the future, determining the old, the old town. So, James Town. So, James Moore's tenure then, as I said, was begun in an interesting set of circumstances. Um, it was begun, and that's by the way the, the set of records before I go further into that, that's the set of records that this talk is based on. It's uh, MS 57371 and age in 1742-1765, although 1742 I think was wrong, it begins a bit earlier. Well, what else happened in 1740? The Great Frost of 1740. Now, a lot of people say, what? They don't know what you're talking about when they talk of the Great Frost. This climate event, when they talk of the Great Frost, this climate event is estimated to have killed between 13 and 20% of the 1740 Irish population of 2.4 million. Between 13 and 20%, which was proportionately greater to the number of people, which was proportionately greater to the number of people who died during the famine of 1845-47. But we don't hear about it, right? It wasn't a famine, per se. It was famine. People died of hunger. For example, the failure of the grain and the data crops was widespread across Europe. Across Europe, right? By early January 1740, the Liffey, the Boyne, the Slaney, the Lee, the File, and sections of the Shannon were frozen solid. Right? The bay here was frozen out probably 500 metres. 
right? The cold, frosty condition. However, uh, we can take it that it was pretty serious. One can imagine the circumstances. The town was at the end of a precarious road system. Um, the harbour was inaccessible. The extreme weather event continued until September 1741 with a series of violent storms. 1741 with a series of violent storms and floods. And then the weather returned to more usual conditions. That was the beginning of James Moore's tenure here in the town. So you can imagine the circumstances that Moore was facing as he began his, his development of the town. Just keep that at the back of your heads. So, there's little enough documentation at the time that I was doing my research for Newport's history, although Peter has come up with more and others. John Moore has come up with some stuff on the lease. So there's other stuff coming to light. But for the most part, you have to, I had to draw, if you like, comparative uh, comparative census, similar towns, try and look at similar estates. But uh, this record is the one that exists and it was the most useful one to me in trying to understand Newport in those many years of the 18th century. And just as a matter of interest, it's, uh, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. Just as a matter of interest, it's, uh, I'm fascinated by this kind of stuff. Like, what, does, what does this look like? Well, the manuscript has over 200 leaves of paper, which is slightly larger than Phil's pack, but they're individually ruled with a cash column in each leaf. So everything I'm saying is based on a series of accounts of entries written by a man called James Moore. A series of accounts of entries written by a man called James Moore. Right? The manuscript, he writes in the first, he writes the initial pages are comprised his personal accounts, his own business, if you like. And there's 83 pages in that. And then what does he do? He takes the manuscript, turns it upside down, and starts it back. And he keeps the accounts of the, the state. So it's, it's fascinating like, to try and juggle the two and figure out what's what. So the manuscript is reversed, as I said, and continued. There's a sequence of folio numbers are used from the mid point to the end of the manuscript, beginning around folio 94, after which there's other unnumbered pages and there's bits and pieces, loose pages. There's a, a lovely letter from his daughter up in Belfast. Um, there are other bits and pieces, notes, receipts, some legal documents, <coughs> and some things like investigations of type, uh, titles. Now, his accounts are divided into himself, and he wrote this lovely one that I, I really enjoyed, but apparently it was a feature of 18th century accounting, God be praised, I am worth. And he, he ended every year with his God be praised, I am worth, and he had answered the amount of money he was now, he now valued himself at. Right? And then he had another unfortunate. I love those kind of things. So he had to try and figure out what the hell is he talking about here? You know? Income of my collection. Then he had a laid out account. I think it's the way a modern person like me who has no accountancy training might even write down our accounts. You know, income of my collection. Whoa, I collected that. Uh, income, uh, income of my private fees and fines, which is straightforward, and that's it. So there's an interrelationship between these various accounts, you know. There's no tidy conclusion. That's the interesting thing as well. They just finish. Boom. Midstream. 1765. It's almost as if he stopped writing, went and lay down and died. 1765. It's almost as if he stopped writing, went and lay down and died. You know, there's just no end to it. Um, so, you know, that's it. His death is recorded in the December issue of George Fox's <coughs> Dublin Journal. In the, on the 17th of December, uh, to the, uh, on the journal from, in the, on the 17th of December, uh, to the, uh, on the journal from 17th of December, 24th of December, 1765. So the end of the accounts is obviously related to his death. He suddenly he just didn't decide I'm not going to keep accounts anymore. He just died, and that was it. Unfortunately, uh, we're not sure of the exact date that he became agent. But curious about it because it's. On the 25th of November, 1741, he said that I am worth 2,976 pounds. <coughs> 2,976 pounds in 1740? That's a hell of a lot of money. Do you know? And I'll give you a comparison, I'll show you. And I'll give you a comparison, I'll show you. I'll give you a comparison of modern money to that. So from the nature of the account at this time and the substantial value of almost 3,000 on this date, 
you can assume that he'd been working with these accounts and figures for some time, or he started off with a certain amount of capital. So this amount of three thousand so this amount of three thousand, for example, just to put it into context for you, in seventeen forty, that amount of money would buy six hundred cows. So just think about that, right? Or in current terms, if you like, three hundred and fifty thousand pounds sterling or over four hundred I wouldn't mind starting with that. That was a nice view about to be starting with your your tenure in the town. So you know, there will be other people who will document later documents and may throw more light on Moore's first engagement, but that's where I'm at. So his, his involvement with the town from the 1740s until his death, is, it's, um, most of the town was built on the north side uh, of, 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 the, of the river. Um, I love that north side because I'm a north sider, and anybody who's a north sider, does anybody from Dublin here is a north sider, they'll know exactly what I mean very proud of being Northsiders, and Moore, Moore has built his town on the north side, so the town on the north side, so there you go. The approach road from Castle Bar didn't cross the river where it does today, um, but we came in by Nottavilly Glebe and came across where the bridge is today, right? Um, the Church of Ireland Church, therefore, was near close to the road and the graveyard over in Nottavilly, right? Or in Nottavilly, right? And that was built in the early years of the 18th century, and as I said, uh, Dr. Polcock mentions it in 1752 when he preached there. Uh, the river variously called the, the Black Oak, the Palm Dara Diver, the Brown Oak, the Newport River, and uh, I guess I don't know, Sharon McGovern tonight, and Sharon said, <coughs> she's reading the book, she said, Do you think that the Black Oak River was called after Grace O'Malley's father, uh, who was, you know, he's known as Black? Um, uh, maybe it was. I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. Why it's why it's called why it was called that. Dira diva is why it's called why it was called that. Dira diva is, is obviously black oak, translated from Irish. You know. But anyway, the other thing to notice that the Newport River, just a matter of interest, probably people will know this, but it's tidal up to roughly Nakabili Glee, up to Lees, as I would call it, the house on the side of the road. Now, on the, on the housing question, have I got my slides right? Yeah. Uh, by the way, a pound sterling would pay a skilled a trades, a tradesman for 10 days, just to give you an idea what kind of things cost, what a labour cost, that to give you an idea. So there, if you like, and I'm going to stand over here and have a look at it, but there is something on the housing. Mostly, as I said, on the north side. Many of the old street names remain, and others which are no longer in use can be indicated by people around the town today. And the folk memory would have some information about the shape and layout of the town. Market Street, now Main Street, information about the shape and layout of the town. Market Street, now Main Street, Weaver's Row has become Castle Bar Street. Barrack Hill is still in use, and there was obviously a barrack there, uh, as is Medicott Street, which is very obviously, and was the first street. And you, an architectural person would tell you, in looking at some of the houses on Metricot Street, the architectural person would tell you, in looking at some of the houses on Metricot Street, they can see the type of lintels and uh, the type of building structure of the windows and the, the, the way there's one door and two windows upstairs and one down. Fascinating that those <coughs> houses have retained their shape and retained their, their, their facades. There was the truck and corn mill, which he mentioned in his accounts. And there was a place referred to as the salmon box, which was obviously on the river, and shows you the importance of fishing and salmon, salmon at that time. The custom house was situated, situated along the quay, and I think that might have been the building that I showed you in the very first slide that we looked at. So another place was there was a tan yard, uh, but water supply would be desirable, and hence it too was probably down by the river. Uh, you'll probably hear from John Moore when he's talking about Pratt that sometimes people name things like there was a lake, there's a lake out there or out past the football pitch and it's called Bleach Yard. So it's obviously renamed and it's called Bleach Yard. So it's obviously renamed to suit the linen bleaching and the retting of the, the, the flax prior to the, the making of uh, the linen uh, the linen pot yarn, I suppose it's the correct word. So there's lots of References to repairs, to surveys, and to any the buildings wasn't great. Some of the rebuilt ones, such as the market house, must have been of better quality. And I don't know if I've mentioned it in that, but he talks about 
you know, you can see there the different things laid out as several times repairing the old market house. So it was obviously what the market house wasn't doing that well and had to be repaired. It wasn't doing that well and had to be repaired. Right? And pointing Robert Clark's house and saving again. 1754, he's trying to save market stones and he's paying out this amount of money. It's not very much, but someone was getting paid out for saving the stones. Here it is again. And here's another one. Isn't this an interesting one? Again. And here's another one. Isn't this an interesting one? Paid the priest of Newport to build a chapel. Ten pounds. A lot of money. And that's probably the chapel that was just where uh, where Carmont, where the where the Hellings is, probably in that in that area there, in the first church in the town. The one that I showed you there in the first church in the town. The one that I showed you in the slide in eighteen twenty three is much later and it's up on the hill, uh, St Joseph's. So and then look at this, the presentment to get uh, for Newport Bridge, you know? So they were obviously doing work on the bridge at that stage, which kind of was obviously an older bridge. So there must have been an earlier bridge there. And it's an interesting part of the river. If you observe it at a low tide, it's possibly it's possible to walk across it when the tide is low, because the, it's very broad, and therefore maybe in those days, carts and horses cross pulled but only later then does the bridge become part of the scene, right? Uh, again, he's in 1758, he's rebuilding the market house, it's probably fallen down so well. Uh, and Alex Scott's house, which was burnt, was attached, and therefore was that a problem? And repairing Don Levy's house, which burnt. These are directly, again, expending money on Sarah Connolly's house, which fell. And uh, in 1763, uh, two years rent allowed to the widow Connolly, which I charged myself in the rent row to build her house, which fell. There's an example for me, and you'll see these little small little things throughout the accounts that show me. She's a widow, so there's no other money coming, there's no rental. So, but he's still looking after her, and he's building the house. He's rebuilding her house for her, and it cost a few bob. Right? So, you know, these are some of the things that you can, can point to and try to interpret and try and work out what type of, of person to and try to interpret and try and work out what type of, of person he was. Right? So, um, um, if you, another thing to do is to look at some of the, if you like, the, the deeds of the houses on the main street. And I've looked at of the houses on the main street. And I've looked at one particular, and some of the people here will know that we, myself and Pauline, actually owned one of them at one stage in a moment of madness. But uh, not that there's anything wrong with the house, by the way, it was wrong with us. Um, but I looked at the deeds for one particular house and discovered they were discovered they were 1796. Now the registry of deeds exists some from what? From the early, I think from 1709 or around that time. So those the deeds for Newport, maybe they weren't just registered, but I don't think that the main street houses were built at that time. I think they were built uh, later as main street would have been built much later. We also know, for example, that the bill house would have been, couldn't have been built that early because it was built by money from the Danish government as a gesture of goodwill to the people of Newport who looked after the sailors from the from the, uh, the Bjorn home, which ran into the sailors from the from the uh, the Bjorn home, which ran into such trouble out in the bay. So we know that a lot of those houses were not built until much later. And also, if you, I'm sure, if you talk to architectural experts, they'll show you just down beside Sheridan's shop. There's a lovely, some lovely hours. And again, an expert better than me would tell you, ah, yes, that can be dated to such and such a time. So we could figure out when those buildings were possibly built or when they were refurbished. So there's a lot of interesting work still to be done in the street work to work out things, right? So if you like, then, there were to register deeds in order to provide some form of security uh, of tenure. And that's why uh, the registry of deeds became important to so many people. So, in terms of the quality and the falling down of houses and all the other things that went on, was Newport an exception? And the answer seems that housing seems to be borne out in other instances in Connacht. 
And Mrs. Pendarves, who played a long visit to Connacht in 1720, remarked that the gentry of the reason did not seem to want good houses or more furniture than was absolutely necessary. But they made up for it in eating and drinking. To visit a patched cabin, to be told that it belonged to a gentleman of £1,500 per annum, who gave entertainments of 20 dishes of meat in his patched cabin. So, maybe we had some priorities, right, right in the 18th century. Right? Moore himself, by the way, James Moore kept a garden. Moore himself, by the way, James Moore kept a garden, and his accounts refer to him as having three gardens. Which is interesting. He had as follows. Um, where is that? He had the garden, the little garden, and the flax garden. He had the garden, the little garden, and the flax garden. And it's interesting, the flax garden. Again, that reference to flax growing, to linen, to bleach yards, and to that tradition in Newport that existed of linen continued right up into James Moore's up into continued right up into James Moore's up into the 1760s, even though the Quakers were gone at that stage. And kind of in my mentality I always associate the Quakers with Lynn and Newport, but there were others doing it as well. And Moore may have been one of those. So there's not much else that refers specifically of the townhouses and the surveying the plots for building. So right up to the last years of his life He's planning, he's plotting, he's repairing the custom house, the brew house, the widow's house, all claim his attention, as did the planting of trees between the custom house and the town. If you like, an early attempt at landscape planning by the land, if you like, an early attempt at landscape planning by the land agent. And again, I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in these, and maybe I should have gone and looked, and I should have asked, just maybe just asked. There are a lot of beech trees growing along inside Newport House Wall. And I wonder, beech trees live long, don't they? They live a couple of hundred years. And I wonder, beech trees live long, don't they? They live a couple of hundred years. I wonder if some of those were planted as saplings by James Moore back in the in 1750, 1760, and then 200 years later, they're fully mature. Maybe not. Maybe they're planted. Maybe they're a second crop, if you like. But it's interesting, if you like. But it's interesting that that's what he was doing. He was planting trees between the custom house and the town, an early attempt at landscape planning. The port itself, again, as I said, there's lots of references to it. Uh, as early as 1745, uh, oh yeah, I mentioned those, uh, fees that he was collecting. Oh, stop. Oh, I'm gone, I'm lost. Oh, I'm going backwards, sorry. <laughs> I'm out of practice with this one. Yeah, I want to just go back one. These are some of the court fees that he was collecting uh, between 1742 and 17, uh, between 1742 and 1753. Again, it will be worth sitting down and getting uh, corresponding figures and figure out what, you know, what was involved in each ship, uh, how much did it cost, to, to, uh, how much had to be collected in revenue, etc. And then you might be able to work out something from that about the, the value of cargoes, etc., and so on. But, uh, for example, here's a 1745 cargo, and he sold 89 Newport barrels of malt, and he had 191 hundredweight of wheat, and he bark, uh, and uh, bark stone, he freight, uh, uh, he freight of eight tons of bark from Mr. Davis. These were all things, if you like, the cargoes that he was dealing in in the in the shipping, right? Well, that's that goes to the end. So, so just looking at that, then we can see that. Um, key looking at that, then we can see that um, the key was to play an important part. Ships of two hundred tons, and there are many references in the accounts to goods arriving by sea. And the harbour was well protected from all but the most violent storms, as we know. And James Moore did his job as collecting the, the, the and James Moore did his job as collecting the, the, the port fees. There are lots of references to different ships, uh, and the one that struck me uh, was that there's more references to wines and spirits almost than anything else. Uh, there's also re reference to ships in trouble, and you were talking about wrecks. 
uh, there are references to ships in trouble, and he often bought the rigging and the masts and the booms from ships and sold them on at a profit, which is interesting. So he, you know, he, he, he fingers in all kinds of pies. Um, and I said he also recorded buying drinks for the count, and that it tells us that in 1744 he was importing me, uh, grain into Mayo. So we know of the famine, of, 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 I call it the famine or the harvest failure of, of 1739, 40, 41 due to the Great Frost. Harvest failed again in 1744, and this accounted probably for his anxiety about raising evidence for the actual state of the harvest in this area at this time. So we can only assume that the pattern of famine after famine affected Newport <coughs> like everywhere else. Uh, on a lighter note, as I said, the sailors got their drink when the cargo was unloaded. Scales were made ready beforehand, and Moore assiduously stopped money for deficiency, watching what was coming off, and the cargo was damaged, maybe storm at sea, uh, salt water affecting stuff, etc., and so on. And he cut back, he said, No, we won't pay for that. Right? So it was a result of all this then that he often felt magnanimous enough. And in one particular year, uh, he, don uh, he donated £8.40 to charity in the town. Now, remember what we said, you know, that was a lot of money. That would pay a man and pay, pay for food and pay for a skilled uh, labourer for at least eight weeks. So that was quite a bit to give out at least eight weeks. So that was quite a bit to give out in charity in the town. And bear in mind that the amount he donated, like, as I said, 80, 80 days of skilled labour. It's worth noting that his salary as collector of fines, half money and portuguese <coughs> amounted to about £126. His half money and portuguese <coughs> amounted to about £126 annually, he himself. Uh, I want to just say, kind of moving on and getting towards the end, I just want to say a few things about religion. Um, a sample of religious references comes up in the, in the accounts as well, uh, and shows what I would consider. Um, the Quakers certainly were the first. Uh, they, uh, they left, as we know, uh, not, unfortunately before they left they had a wedding which left us uh, a Quaker, uh, a Quaker, if you like, um, witness statement where everybody who attended the, attended the, uh, wedding, the uh, wedding signed the witness statement and among the names, and my son Peter talked about this, was O'Donnell. The O'Donnells were, were, were at the wedding. The only people you probably wouldn't find at that wedding were Church of Ireland people, traditional Anglican Church of Ireland people. Uh, it would be all Protestant people. Uh, it would be all you, you know, the Catholics the, and the, the Quakers and people like that who would have been at that wedding and signed the witness statement. And so we see the O'Donnells were actually in Newport at the stage and were part of the community. So, you know, that's the Quakers and they left. The Catholics laws and probably with if you like some connivance by James Moore are just ignoring the situation and letting people get on with it. In for example, in 1743 he had money uh, almost one euro, which you might say well one euro, but think of in 1743, in 53, due to Mulcrown the priest, money in my hands, six pounds twenty-one. Six pounds twenty-one belonged to Father Mulcrown, the priest of Newport. So he was looking after his money, and as he does say it is due to Mulcrown, the priest, he hadn't taken it from him. Well, Catholics, while they're not generally referred to, except for the financial arrangements cited above, and before, and before 1755, it must have been the case that Mass was also celebrated by priests, because we know from our local history here that we have a number of Mass rocks. There's one out past my house in Glen Hest, uh, and a lovely carved cross there on the stone. There's on Portfeeve um, and Martin's, wherever he is, I don't know where he's gone, Martin's country out there in Portfeeve. There's another one at Ovalis, uh, which uh, on the, in what, what date is it? Each year on the Monday uh, of the June Bank holiday weekend, modern, each year on the Monday uh, of the June Bank holiday weekend, modern pilgrims make their way to this place, and um, everybody, Catholics, Protestants, and dissenters. They all go there on that particular Sunday to mark that particular uh, mass rock. 
So we're left then with a picture of a community or a mass rock. So we're left then with a picture of a community from, again, as I say, from this account, uh, the religion is predominantly Church of Ireland. Quakerism didn't, just, didn't survive the 1740s. And despite his best efforts and five visits to Newport, including a small Methodist church erected in the 1760s, John Wesley appears to have abandoned the hope of establishing a strong Methodist community in the town. So we have... We had our, our, and I always find it interesting when I'm talking to people, we have the Quakers, we have Roman Catholics, we have Church of Ireland, we have Presbyterians, and don't forget, and I don't know if you're going to mention them, Peter, the Darbyites, right? John Darby, the solicitor who founded that, that particular sect, it's very much Pilgrim Father, type, Pilgrim Father's type of sect. And believe it or not, and I'm not going to mention names, there are still people of such sect, and believe it or not, and I'm not going to mention names, there are still people associated with that particular religious view still living in the area, which is interesting, right? So you see all these communities, and for me, the Catholics remained an enigma, despite the brief glimpses we get of some events, such as the erection of the new church, <coughs> I've mentioned a little bit as well, but he was murdered. Priest, Father Macron, was murdered in the town. But when it was all sorted out, it was his servants who murdered him. They probably thought they were going to get some money or something, I don't know. All these indications and the absence of any reports of antagonism seem to confirm the majority of religion. And yet if one wished to progress socially and economically, conforming was the order of the day. And he's going to tell you all about the man who decided uh, to choose that course of action. Neil O'Donnell's father died in 1762, and by 1780, Sir Neil, <coughs> Neil was to become Sir Neil, a member of the Church of Ireland, and the O'Neill dynasty was to begin. There's a good intro for you, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, even if only for a brief century, until the death of Sir George. So, that's the situation uh, with, the, with the, the thing I could go on and talk about the thing. One thing I would like to just finish on, the thing I could go on and talk about the thing. One thing I would like to just finish on, some of the names that struck me, and you've been talking about that, some of the names that I came across that, I, that struck me as originally from outside Newport. Some of the, if there's any chambers here, please don't shoot me for saying this and thinking <laughs> you're from outside Newport. But there were Scott, Marshall, Chambers, Hamilton, Hamilton, and McLaughlin. And those are the names that I found in greater numbers among the attempts. That as a, just to finish, then, the town hinged upon the land agent and the port collector, James Moore. And there seemed to be a peaceful coexistence of all interests, religion, trade, and otherwise. The religion, trade, and otherwise. The poor, the native Irish are not directly alluded to, but a new rising class of achievers in the persons of the O'Donnells are and they would conform to take advantage of economic and social progress. Uh, there are all the trades, as I've mentioned, from blacksmiths to grocers to linen workers. And linen workers. Alcohol plays a major role, doesn't it always? Uh, there's uh, Pearl Anthony Shee seems to be the main, main importer. He's listed as a subscriber to Taylor and Skinner's Maps of the Roads of Ireland. That might be him. But it was James Moore himself then that died without, if you like, without what was recorded uh, in the Freeman's Journal at Newport in the county of Mayo, James Moore Esquire, formerly collector of the court. And he's laid to rest in the Moore Vault, as I said, which has been desecrated in Knockabilly Glebe, and the headstone reads, and I think I have it there, this vault contains the remains of reeds, and I think I have it there, this vault contains the remains of James Moore, the late collector of Newport, his wife Margaret, his mother, Deborah Moore, his daughter Philippa, and her husband Roger Shield. And it was Roger who purchased the ground and caused the vault to be built in the year 1766. Those who see. <laughs> so that's a little bit of James Moore and his influences and effects on the town. Um, uh, and yeah, that's it. That's all I can offer.